Our class today, we're talking today about the general epistles. Last week, or last time we met, we uh, dealt, I think it was last week, wasn't it last week? We <laughs> <laughs> can keep track. Let me look at my notes. <laughs> um, we dealt with the second half of the Pauline epistles. Of course, and in fact, I want to. Uh, this is our schedule, and as you'll see, we we started with the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the same seeing historic Gospels. Then we looked at the Gospel of John and the Book of Acts, the story of the early church. We then went on to Paul and the Pauline Epistles, one, which was the the earliest five of Paul's epistles. Then the last uh, time we met, we dealt with the Pauline Epistles, two, Romans, Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, First and Second Timothy, and Titus. We now come to the next section in our New Testament, which is called, which are called generally the general epistles. Okay? They are sometimes called the Catholic epistles. Not because they're Roman Catholic, but because Catholic, remember, means universal. These epistles, I'm going to talk about that in more detail. Whereas Paul's epistles are all written either to a specific church or to a specific person, in the case of the pastoral epistles, he wrote to Timothy and Titus. The general epistles are not written to a specific church or to a specific person, with the possible exception of John 2 and 3, or 2 and 3 John, sorry, we'll talk about that. So today we're looking at the general epistles. The best way probably to think about them are the non-Pauline epistles, because there's even a problem with calling all of these general epistles or Catholic epistles, and I'll talk about that. Next week, we will look at the book of Revelation and the expectations for fulfillment, and then the last meeting that we have, which for this class will be on the 4th of March, we'll spend the first hour uh, looking at sort of a conclusion and wrapping up of New Testament survey. And the second half, we will take the test, which I encourage all of you to do. You'll, you'll survive and everything. You'll be good. <laughs> all right. Uh, I want to give you something I've not done given to you before, I don't think, and that is this version of the organization of New Testament books. I'm backing up a little bit and giving you a little survey again. The start of the New Testament are the four Gospels, which are the good news about the life, ministry, and sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus. Those are broken up into the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then the fourth Gospel, the Gospel of John, which is less historical and more, um, more theological. It's a different style in its approach. We then have, unique to itself, the book of Acts, which is the history of the early church, written by the Gospel writer Luke. So that Luke and Acts are sort of the first and second chapter of the story of Jesus and the story of, of the early church as a continuum. We then have 21 epistles, and you, of course, know that epistle means letter. There were letters written to believers within the church. Um, Thirteen of those are attributed to the Apostle Paul. Uh, most of them are written to Christian communities, and they are named for the community they're written to. Romans wasn't written from Rome, it was written to the Roman church. Corinthians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, to the church in Corinth, the Galatian letter to the churches in Galatia, etc. Then the pastoral epistles, as they're called, Paul wrote to uh, Christian leaders, Timothy and Titus, and Philemon specifically. Okay? Then we have um, this, this section here, I've got one biblical sermon, Hebrews. And then seven general or non-Pauline epistles. You'll notice I've separated Hebrews out. Traditionally, Hebrews is not included as one of the general epistles because, well, I'll talk about why that is in a minute. For the sake of our concern, uh, considerations, and in fact, like in the uh, Nelson book that you've got, it is listed as a general epistle. More and more today is considered a general epistle, and I'll talk about why it used to not be and why it used to be considered kind of unique. It is a little bit different in that the, the letter to the Hebrews, as we'll talk about, is more of a sermon than it is a letter. And so that's why we say here, one biblical sermon. Then we have seven general or Catholic or non-Pauline epistles written to the broader church rather than to a specific group or individual. That is, those are the epistles of James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. And then, what we'll talk about next week is we have one apocalyptic letter. Remember, apocalypse does not mean everything blows up in the end. <laughs> the word apocalypse means revelation. That's why our English word for it is revelation. An apocalyptic letter is a letter that reveals something that was previously hidden. So the apocalypse or the book of revelation, which is symbolic and prophetic, especially with regard to how time will end. Now again, I give this to you, not so much because it's appropriate to our content discussion today, but this is now online for you. So you can go and pull that up and use it. Okay? Um, all of these things.
things, of course, are on PowerPoint. As soon as Carolyn, you know, does the great work of putting them online, and you all need to thank Carolyn for all the work she does to get these videos up and to get these PowerPoints up. She's uh, and she's created the website and the whole thing. So I'd say that even if she wasn't my lovely wife. So okay, um, let's talk about. The Catholic or Universal Epistles, sometimes called the General Epistles, I do think that the most accurate name for them probably is simply the non-Pauline Epistles, meaning all of the letters that were not written by Paul. Um, those letters, and I include Hebrews here, and I'll talk about why Hebrews is a problem uh, as, a, as a general or um, Catholic Epistle in a minute. The letter to the Hebrews is a presentation to Jewish Christians of Jesus as the great high priest. It is very Jewish in its orientation. Uh, Jesus is presented as priest and king, um, you know, the, the expectation of the Jews. Interestingly enough, the writer of Hebrews apparently didn't speak Hebrew very well. His quotes are all from the Septuagint, the Greek uh, New Testament, or the Greek uh, Old Testament, rather. And so um, we'll, we'll get into details about these because we're going to unfold them one at a time. We then have the book of James, which if you come to our Bible study, we have been getting in-depth in the study of James, which is a practical instruction on how faith should show itself in righteous living. Faith without works is dead, very famously said by James. That if you have a true faith, there should be some sign of it in terms of how you live your life. We then have the two letters of Peter. First Peter is an encouragement and a comfort to suffering Christians on various aspects of Christian life and duty, suffering because they were beginning to suffer persecution. Um, several of the letters in the general epistles address the issue of Christian persecution. The other major theme in these is false teaching, which we'll get into some details about. So, 1 Peter is encouragement to suffering Christians who are suffering persecution. The second, and then 2 Peter, warns against false teaching, especially false Gnostic teachers. We have several letters in the New Testament which deal with Gnostic heresy. The Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, is based upon the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. The Gnostic heretics believe that um, the key to salvation was to have secret knowledge. I always sort of say it's sort of like you have to know the secret password and the secret handshake, the Gnostics thought. Um, that it, because they thought it's a matter of knowledge, Rather than a matter of sin, they didn't think we needed a Savior. And so they didn't think of Jesus as a Savior. They thought he was just the most knowing of the teachers that had come along. And they also, being very Greek in their orientation, had a very different view about the human body. Any material thing was considered evil to them. And so Jesus could not have been God and a physical being. So it must have been just a mirage that he was a physical being. So there's all sorts of things wrong with that. I'll talk about that a little bit more. One of the strange things to me is that Galatians addresses the Gnostic heresy, 2 Peter addresses the Gnostic heresy, 2 John, and probably some of 3 John addresses the Gnostic heresy, the letter of Jude addresses the Gnostic heresy, and yet everybody says the Gnostic heresy didn't occur, you know, the liberal scholars at least, say the Gnostic heresy didn't occur until the 2nd century. And so they said, so these letters must have been written later. <laughs> It's sort of like I have heard the expression before that, um, that liberal uh, scholars will say, um, well, these, these, and don't take this as a, uh, as a valuation of the doctrine of creation or anything, but they'll say, okay, these bones are 900 bazillion years old. And they'll go, well, how do you know? Well, they're in a strata of uh, geology that's 900 bazillion years old. That's how we know they're 900 Brazilian. Well, how do you know that that level of strata, geological strata, is 900 Brazilian years old? Well, dummy, we just told you that it had 900 Brazilian year old bones in it. <laughs> well, that, that sort of parody of, of things is exactly what it appears to me happens on this issue of Gnostic teaching. We have like six letters in the New Testament, which by almost universal attribution of the early church, were all written in the first century. They all talk quite specifically about the Gnostic heresy, and yet liberal scholars say the Gnostic heresy didn't occur until the second century. So these must be older books, or I mean, more recent books, uh, not older, younger books. And yet you're going, well, duh, it's that circular logic again. They can't be talking about the Gnostic heresy because the Gnostic heresy came later, and yet these came, and so, uh, anyway, you get the idea. 
Um, <laughs> uh, so, 2 Peter deals with uh, the false teachers, specifically the not false Gnostic teachers, and I'll talk a little bit more about Gnosticism later. 1 John, of the first three epistles of John, these, is, these were written by John the Apostle, who also wrote the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, that we'll talk about next week. The first uh, letter of John, Epistle of John, is a reminder on the humanity of Jesus, a fellowship with God, and opposition to false doctrine. Second John, which is only, second, third John, each are only one chapter long. And some people who say, oh, well, John didn't write this, some, some wise scholars have pointed out, why in the world would anybody try to falsify something as short as second John and third John? It's not like you're going to accomplish very much. Why try to, you know, pull that hoax off? Anyway. Second John is a letter that encourages discernment, again, to keep away from hosting false teachers, and particularly to keep them from coming and staying in your home if they're teaching something contrary to the gospel. Third John is a commendation for righteous Christian leaders, especially men named Gaius, and a warning against those who are unrighteous. You don't want to be like the Diotrephes. We'll talk about it. And then the book of Jude, short book, is a strong warning against false teachers, especially those teaching that grace allows licentiousness, which was part of the Gnostic heresy. Okay? This is online for you. You can, you can have a look at it. Um, let's talk about, and I'm going to leave that slide up there, and talk for a few minutes about these general epistles. Again, they're called the general epistles. They are the, the non-Pauline epistles, but they're called the general or Catholic epistles because unlike Paul's letters, these letters were not written to a specific group of people or church, like the Corinthians or the, the Thessalonican church or whatever, uh, nor were they written to individuals. They were written to large bodies of people, like Peter's books apparently were written to the churches, and he actually mentions several Roman provinces in Asia, but that would have been to all the churches that would have been in that area, not to, not to just one or two or three. Um, the only exception we have to that sort of general broadcast kind of thing from the general epistles is that 2nd and 3rd John um, identified that they are being written to the elect lady and at one point to Gaius. Um, now, the elect lady may have been a woman because it talks about the elect lady and, and the blessing of her children. But uh, it's more likely that he was using that as a metaphorical reference to the church that the church is the elect lady, and that the children of the church were the churches that have been planted by this church. Okay, So uh, it's probably not a person, although it could be. You know, we, we may find out someday, we may meet her someday, we may find out that it was a particular woman. Um, it's also true that whereas uh, Paul's epistles are all named for either the church or the people, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, that it's being written to, Turn that upside down, the general epistles are all uh, named for the author who wrote them, with the single exception of Hebrews, which is sort of who it's being written to, and we'll talk about that. Okay? So there are several differences between the Pauline epistles and how they're basically presented, and the general epistles, or Catholic epistles, or non-Pauline epistles. Um, yes? Uh, do we know uh, how the church uh, established uh, calling uh, calling the church uh, in a female way. In other words... Um, Why did they call the church her? Yes. Her, the yes. Bride, the bride of well, it is referred to as the bride of Christ, and so there is the counterpoint to the male, Jesus. Yes. Um, that could be part of it. Um, why are hurricanes always female? You know. <laughs> well, they should be in the game. Well, it could very well be because the bride is, uh, we are identified as the bride of Christ, yes. which is a, you know, it's a female uh, yes. uh, example. But uh, it could have just been a tradition that grew up in the same way that we assign you know, gender-specific uh, pronouns to See. different categories yes. of things. Yes. Ships are always female. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know. Maybe men are doing it and they want somebody to blame if something goes wrong. <laughs> or, 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 or hurricanes or whatever. Yes. Uh, so I don't I don't want to answer. I think the best one probably yes. would be that we are the right across. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, not a perfect answer, but the best I can do right now. Um, with Michael Sell. Uh, let's see. As I mentioned to you a minute ago, there are eight epistles that we are talking about here, the non-Pauline epistles. 
most modern, most more recent kind of documents will include Hebrews as the first of the general epistles, uh, the first of these as a general epistle. Historically, Hebrews was not included because, for one reason, it didn't, it didn't match all the other criteria. For instance, Hebrews is not named for who wrote it because we don't know who wrote it. We'll talk about that. Um, but rather to, you know, the gen generic kind of Hebrews because it's very Jewish in its orientation. But more specifically, uh, there was a period of time between, uh, of about 1,200 years, between 400 and 1,600. Now you'll notice, 400 is 400 years after Jesus, and 1,600 is right after the Reformation. Between 400 and 1,600, for 1,200 years, they generally said, uh, would say that the, the letter to the Hebrews was written by Paul. Well, there's no early attestation before 400 that it was written by Paul. There's all sorts of reasons to believe, and I'm, I'll get into the specifics when we talk about Hebrews, that it probably wasn't written by Paul, and even has some internal references to it that would suggest that you know, Paul wouldn't be talking about himself that way. And then after the Reformation, and biblical scholarship got more serious, because there was a period of 1,200 years in there when, when biblical scholarship didn't really exist. The only people who read the biblical languages were priests, and the priests their whole focus was trying to, to support and defend the doctrines of the church, not figure out what's really true about it, okay? And so it wasn't until after the Reformation of biblical theology and biblical scholarship really took root again that they started saying, wait a minute, this, this isn't written by Paul. The very earliest documents don't assign it to Paul. They just call it the Hebrews, okay, the book of the Hebrews. And so for all of those reasons, historically, Hebrews was not included as one of these uh, general or epistles. Obviously, it wasn't going to be called the non-Pauline epistles for the 1,200 years that they tried to attribute it to Paul. <laughs> Duh. And so that's why it sometimes stands outside. And it's really split nowadays. You know, modern scholarship, sometimes they'll list it as a general epistle, the book of Hebrews. Sometimes they won't. That's why I had it as a biblical sermon as a separate piece there. Um, the... While I say that the books, the general <clears throat> epistles, are not identified as to a specific church, they do, some of them, do have locations or groups of recipients. For instance, the book of James is addressed to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad, which means uh, Jewish Christians. 12 tribes is a, is a shorthand reference to the Jewish people who are scattered abroad. The Jews have experienced diaspora. And the book of James, uh, I believe, is the first book in the Bible. Uh, everybody agrees it's either, or the New Testament, rather. Everybody agrees it's either the first or the second. Either it or Galatians were written first. And it's interesting that James and Galatians are sort of counterpoint one another. They complement one another in terms of the view of grace and the law. They're not contradictory, but they do give two sides of the coin. Um, first Peter, then, uh, is addressed to, and I quote here, those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Those were Roman provinces that were all part of Northern Asia Minor. But notice it wasn't written to specific churches. Paul's letter to the Galatians was written to the churches in Galatia, but we know exactly which churches they were because he planted them. It was Lystra and Derbe and others. Whereas Paul's letter is much more general than that, even though he tells us what provinces it's being sent to. And so in these non-Pauline epistles, we don't have specific addressees. Um, we don't have names that are based upon who they're being sent to, because we don't know exactly who they're being sent to. And the, they're all named on who wrote them except Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Another way of breaking this out is in terms of these books tend to be either ethical or eschatological, Christological in their focus. Uh, for instance, the book of James and 1 Peter are strongly ethical. They're talking about how you need to live your life if you're a believer in Jesus. That's James and 1 Peter. 2 Peter and Jude are eschatological because they're talking about the coming days and especially the end days and cautioning against following false teachers because of the results that will happen if you follow false teachers at the end days. So they're eschatological, meaning uh, in days or last times kind of references. And then Hebrews and the epistles of John are primarily Christological. They focus on the nature and person of Jesus as the Christ, and they're also ethical. They talk about um, abiding in Christ as God's final revelation, and in the case of Jude, not following, uh, or John, not following false teachers because of that. Hebrews is the most Christological of all the New Testament books. It spends more energy talking about the nature and person of Jesus than any of the other books specifically. 
and we'll get into some detail about that. The general epistles con uh, constitute less than 10% of the New Testament, but the impact that they've had is way more significant than 10%. Some of them, you know, the, the letter to the Hebrews uh, has been a powerful, powerful, because of its picture of Christ, has been a powerful um, uh, force in terms of educating the church for the last 2,000 years. And you get the beauty of John's little epistles. I mean, 1 John is one of the most beautiful of the New Testament in terms of the poetry. It's interesting that John's vocabulary, in both in the Gospel and in the epistles, and even true in Revelation, John's uh, vocabulary is very simple. He's not, he was not an erudite man, apparently, in terms of his language. But what, even though he knew fewer words than Paul or Peter or some of the others, the way he used them is extraordinary. I mean, you get the glory of the Gospel of John, first chapter, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. And he goes on down, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. You know, that kind of power, the words are very simple. Well, the same thing is true when you get into the epistles of John. Same kind of style, very simple vocabulary, but very powerful and beautiful things. Basically, the five... Um, uh, the uh, eight general epistles were written by five people. We know of James, who we believe was the half-brother of Jesus. There are five Jameses in the New Testament we'll talk about. Peter, this is, this is uh, Simon Peter, the first among the apostles during Jesus' life. John, the beloved apostle. Jude, who also, we believe this Jude was the half-brother of Jesus, a different half-brother, uh, full brother to to James, um, the writer of the, the letter of James, and then the author of Hebrews, who we do not have named. So just giving you kind of a, a rough sketch there. It's interesting that in the very earliest manuscripts we have of the New Testament, usually the list is, is the, the Gospels first, and then that varied, that changed up. It's not always Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the ancient documents. Sometimes they would bury them. Sometimes John is first. Usually Matthew was first because it's the most, uh, the most Jewish of the Gospels, and it was seen as kind of the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But you get the Gospels, and then you get Acts, and some people used to refer to that as the Christian Pentateuch. You know, the Pentateuch <coughs> is the five books of law in the Old Testament, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Some people in the early church would refer to the four Gospels and, and the book of Acts as the Christian Pentateuch, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Well, immediately following the book of Acts in some of the most ancient manuscripts were not the letters of Paul. Romans didn't come next in some of the most ancient collections of the New Testament. Instead, these books came next. And they were, one of the reasons was because they're almost all of them more Jewish than Paul's writings. The Hebrews particularly is Jewish, but all of them. James is written very early before there were such a thing as Gentile Christians. He's writing to Jewish believers, the 12 tribes who were scattered abroad. Uh, and so in the earliest versions of our Bible, our New Testament, the general epistles, non-Pauline epistles, came before the Pauline epistles, and then Revelation would finish it out at the end. Okay? And that gives you some idea that throughout the history of the church, these have been um, hugely thought of. I mean, they, they, these, again, even though they're less than 10% of the Bible, I think sometimes we think... Okay, there's the Gospels, and then there's Acts, and there's Paul, and then there's the rest of that stuff. Okay, because Paul seems so dominant in our theology as Gentiles. But that's not the, that has not always been the case in the church. The general epistles were frequently thought of as being even of greater importance to the church, if you, would, if you could say that. I don't know that that's a fair thing to say, but certainly equal to the writings of Paul. And yet, we think of them now as those little books between Paul and Revelation. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's also true when we talk about these being to, written to general audiences, not to specific churches. It's also true that the teachings in these books are very general. In Paul's letters, his letter to the Corinthians, he addresses specific problems that the church in Corinth is having. The same thing to the, to the first and second Thessalonians. He's writing uh, and talking about specific problems that have arisen in the church in Thessalonica. So quite often, Paul's writings are dealing with very specific problems. That is never the case here, with the exception of talking about false teachers. In almost every case, uh, as one writer says, these letters contain no discourses on the meaning of baptism, 
No instruction on how to observe, observe the Lord's Supper, nor how to conduct oneself in the liturgy of the congregation. The only instructions that we find in these epistles are of a general nature, and all of them represent basic teaching. So with the single exception of cautioning people about false teaching, or in the, in the case of 3 John, about either welcoming Christian missionaries or not, um, these are very general in their approach, as opposed to most of the Pauline stuff. Um, and I, like I had a friend of mine once say, she really liked Paul because Paul very specifically told her what she had to do. Okay, she liked that. Whereas some of the general epistles, you you know, you have to work at it a little bit. Um, in terms of, it, it's a broader kind of explanation of things. Any questions about that general kind of overview of the epistles? General epistles, and then we'll get into specifics about the books. Anything? You got a pretty good idea about where these fall? Okay. Let's talk about the book of Hebrews, which is the longest of the general epistles. The first thing that we that jumps out at us at the book of Hebrews is that we, we don't know exactly who it was written to, and we don't know exactly who wrote it. There are a lot of different ideas that go back to the very early church, even, as to who wrote this book, and it's a mystery why we don't know. Because the uh, attribution of authorship was one of the most important factors that was used in deciding whether a book should be part of the Christian canon. If they didn't know who wrote it, if it was anonymous, then they tended not to want to pay any attention to it. Almost all of the books in the New Testament were either written by an apostle or disciple who was with Jesus, or by someone who was a close associate of someone who was an apostle or first-person disciple of Jesus. You know, Matthew and John were apostles. Mark is written by John Mark, who was secretary and assistant to Peter, and it's believed that is pretty much the gospel according to Peter. Luke traveled with Paul through most of his ministry, but he interviewed all the other people who were apostles who knew Jesus. And yet this book, we have no clue, really, who wrote it. Down through time, various ideas have been proposed. Um, Tertullian, fairly early on, said he thought this was written by Barnabas. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who was partner to Paul in his first missionary journey, a major player in the early church and respected by all, a great man of God. Luther came along and said he thought it may have been written by Apollo, because Apollo was a, a Jewish Christian from um, Alexandria, and so had a very strong Greek background, which is reflected in the fact that this is very Greek. I told you that he addresses Jewish issues and Jewish problems, and <clears throat> the, uh, the change from the old law to the new law that, of love that is in Christ, and yet he never quotes anything in Hebrew. It's always in Greek. He only quotes the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. So while he was clearly Jewish, he apparently was a Hellenized Jew, which would have fit Apollo who is recognized as being a very scholarly, very intellectual guy, as he's introduced to us in Scripture. William Ramsey, a scholar, thought that Philip the Evangelist might have been the writer of Hebrews. Um, one of my favorites um, is the idea that it might have been written by Priscilla, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, that this, this letter might have been written by a woman, which actually would explain, might help explain, why it's not attributed to anybody, for sure is because in the early days they would not have wanted to recognize a woman as being the author of a book that everybody agreed seemed to be the Word of God to them, part of the canon. Uh, Carolyn's mother believed that it was Priscilla. <laughs> and she My was, mother she, the theologian. The theologian. She was a theologian in her own right. Uh, <laughs> a theologian without portfolio. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, our old minister in uh, Seattle, who is a great scholar, uh, Earl Palmer, he believes it may have been Priscilla. Now, there's only one thing, as much as I like that idea that mitigates against it, and that is that at one point in the book of Hebrews, um, the author of Hebrews is talking about we did blah blah, and he uses a male version of the pronoun, okay, which mitigates against the idea of Priscilla. Uh, <laughs> because I really like the idea that Priscilla may have written this. But there is some mysterious reason, which we someday will learn, as to why it is that this was, we don't know the author. Now, again, for a period from 400 to 1200, or 1600, sorry, 1200 years, this was thought to be um, authored by Paul, or at least that was just the given, the common thing. There are several reasons now why we don't believe that. And, and I should say, too, that Origen, one of the early church fathers, it, there is some attribution earlier, Origen thought that it might have been Paul's thoughts, but that were written down by either Luke or by Clement of Rome, which is one of the very earliest of the early church fathers. Um, but 
whatever the case was, whether Paul, Barnabas, Apollo, Silas, some people have thought, uh, uh, Priscilla or Aquila and Priscilla, Clement of Rome, whoever it is, we don't know for sure, someday we'll find out. But in the 400s, we had Jerome and, uh, and Augustine. For, for the first uh, 350 years or so, uh, there, was, there were questions in the church as to whether this should be part of the New Testament because they didn't know the author. It wasn't until the 400s that Jerome, who was the one who translated the, the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, into the Latin Vulgate, you know, he translated the Bible into Latin because the Romans were running everything by then. Um, Jerome and Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo, they strongly spoke out for the fact that this should be accepted into the canon. And in order to get it accepted, they advocated, and we believe that some scholars believe that Augustine didn't fully believe this, but he kind of pushed it in order to get him to accept that this was canon. They pushed that Paul might have been the author of it. Now, that's only in the Roman Church or the Western Church. Uh, in Eastern, the Eastern Church, it had always been accept, uh, believed that Paul wrote it because they thought they knew who the author was, and then there was never any question about it being canon in the Eastern half of the Church. And so, and you know what I mean by that, right? The Western half of the Church, which was centered in Rome and spoke Latin, what we now think of as the Catholic Church, in the East, they spoke Greek, and it was that's the basis for Eastern Orthodoxy. But long before the Great Schism in the 1100s, where, where the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Churches split off, already there were so many differences. Um, in the West, they used the, Rome was their center, and they used Latin, and they had their own mass. In the East, their center was Constantinople, and they looked to the patriarch there instead of the Pope, and they used Greek. <coughs> And so there, there were a lot of differences, and one of them was, you know, what did they accept as being fully part of Scripture? The, the actual reason they broke off was kind of a silly reason. So you'll have to come next term to our class on church history, because we'll have a class on church history next term, from the time of Jesus to just before the Reformation, and we'll deal with the Great Schism. Okay. Uh, why do we not think this was written by Paul? And you still get people today who go, oh, Paul had to write this. Paul wrote this. Paul authored this, this letter. Uh, sorry, I don't think so. Uh, most scholars, even conservative scholars, evangelical scholars, no longer think so. The reason is because the style of Hebrew is very different. Now, that by itself is not a good enough reason. Some liberal scholars will take what sounds like differences in style between some of Paul's letters and say, oh, well, that couldn't have been written by Paul because the style is so different. Well, back then, everybody used, pretty much everybody used secretaries or amanuenses. And they would frequently, the style that's reflected in the letter, not the content, not, not what's being said, but how it's said. It may have been more of a reflection of who the secretary was than it was who the writer was, which is why, for instance, Origen thought that Hebrews might have been Paul's thoughts, but written down by Luke or by Clement of Rome, for instance. Um, but the style is different. If that was the only reason, that wouldn't be enough. But the biggest thing to me is that in the second chapter, verse 3, it reads, which at the first uh, began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Well, Paul always insisted that he had a direct revelation from Jesus Christ, not only on the road to Damascus, but through miraculous visions later. Paul would have absolutely, I don't believe, have ever suggested that his experience of the truth that Jesus taught was secondhand. And yet this passage in the second chapter clearly says that they're referring to learning this from the people who actually learned it from Jesus. Paul would not have said that, I don't think. That was, he argues that case over and over and over again, that he is by rights an apostle because he had a direct interaction with and relationship with Jesus Christ, not just through somebody else. Okay? There are other things. Again, the writer of Hebrews apparently did not know Hebrew because he quotes only from the Septuagint, and Paul quotes extensively from both the Septuagint and from the Hebrew Bible, because Paul, Hebrew Hebrews, he described himself. He obviously did speak Hebrew. Um, there are a number of common titles that Paul uses throughout all of his letters for Jesus, which never occur in the book of Hebrews. Um, for instance, the, the title Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, or Kyrios, the Lord, which are the most common names that Paul has for Jesus, never occur in Hebrews. And it's a long enough letter, and he, they refer to Jesus as a member. It's the whole, most Christological of all the letters in the New Testament. And yet, none of those uh, words that Jesus, that Paul uses in reference to Jesus occur in this book. Um, and there's a difference in, in primary focus as well, that Hebrews concentrates on the current priestly ministry of Jesus who intercedes for us in heaven. 
Paul never talks about that. That's never a theme for Paul, and yet that is the thing in the book of Hebrews. Um, so there are lots of reasons why I believe we don't, you know, we don't need to say this is written by Paul, and why we don't think it is written by Paul. And someday we will know who wrote it, and if we're lucky, it'll have been Priscilla. <laughs> but whoever it was, the church has accepted, you know, for uh, since the 400s that yes, this is canon. This is God's word to us, even though, and it's exceptional. I mean, the, the quality and content of Hebrews, the fact that we don't know who wrote it and it was still accepted in canon is a testimony to how important it is as a book and what it has to say to us. All right. Um, where else do I want to go with this? Part of Hebrews. The theme of Hebrews is the surpassing greatness of Christ and his superiority over any other belief, including specifically and especially the Old Testament beliefs. Um, my document here so I can see what you look at. In terms of date, um, we believe that this was probably written around AD 64 to 68. We almost certainly know that it was written before AD 70, and the reason we know that is because. The writer of Hebrews talks about the sacrificial system as part of the priestly, uh, the, the priestly activities of the, the Jewish temple. And he compares that to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ once for all. Well, if this had been written after A.D. 70, then the writer, with all this conversation about the sacrificial system of the Jews, would almost certainly have said, and that's not being done anymore because the, Rome, the temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed. Because in AD 70, all of that stuff that the writer of Hebrews is talking about changed. And he makes no reference to that. We believe it almost certainly was AD 64 to 68. It is quoted in AD 95 by Clement of Rome. And there's always kind of a sense, if something gets quoted as scripture by one of the early church fathers, it probably took 20 or 25 years between the time it first got written and the time it got distributed widely. Remember, they didn't have email back then. And everyone started accepting it as being a God. And so if Clement of Rome quotes it in 95, we don't believe uh, that's consistent with the idea that it would not have been written after AD 70 because it does not refer to the destruction of the temple. It does present Jesus Christ as the high priest. It has a very Jewish kind of approach to understanding Jesus as the Messiah who fulfills all of the priestly expectations of the Jewish law and the Jewish priestly system so that, that those things are no longer necessary. Um, the purpose is to convince wavering Jewish Christians to continue, continue in their faith. There's an indication from what's in, I mean the content of Hebrews, that these are Jewish Christians that he's writing to, he or she is writing to, and that they have committed their lives to Jesus Christ, but that their teachers, the ones who had led them to the faith in Jesus, have died out. And since they have died out, there is a danger that these Hebrew Christians might slide back into their, Jew, their original Jewish faith and forsake their Christian beliefs. And so the writer of Hebrews is warning and trying to convince these Jewish Christians not to backslide into the Jewish faith, but to remember that Jesus, whom they have believed in and testified to for some time now, that he... Is the, most, is the superior way to understand God. In fact, the three sections you can divide, and most of this content, by the way, is in your book, your Nelson book. It, it breaks up these uh, in outline. The writer of Hebrews talks about the superiority of Christ's person as being the one who saves us. He then talks about the superiority of Christ's work, his activity in not only saving us, but sanctifying us through the Holy Spirit, and then the superiority of the walk of faith, of continuing to walk as a believer in Jesus Christ. So these, these themes of superiority, words like better or holier or heavenly occur over and over and over again in the book, in the book of Hebrews. Okay? I want to give you a couple of key verses for Hebrews. Not James, Hebrews. <coughs> this seems quick. Um, Hebrews 4, and I can pick a bunch because Hebrews is very quotable. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, there's that priesthood of Jesus, we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. 
Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You'll hear, if you go to Lakeside Presbyterian, you'll hear some aspect of that quoted often in our prayer of confession, in, um, in the words of institution when we have uh, communion. We talk about the fact that we, we have a great high priest who has been tempted in every way that we have and yet was without sin and that uh, he is able to sympathize for us in our weakness, that sort of thing. And then from Hebrews 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set down, uh, set before him, sorry, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the book of Hebrews. It's a wonderful, very quotable book. Again, I could give you a dozen different places where just zingers, real, really powerful verses in the book of Hebrews. Any questions about that? About Hebrews? Yes? In Scorning Its Shame, uh, Jesus is speaking of the, the shame of sin. Is that correct? Um, no, he's scorning the shame of the cross. Of the cross. Because, because it was... It was a curse. Exactly. Uh, cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. It was a it was part of the Old Testament. And so the very idea, a lot of Jews had trouble believing Jesus could be the Messiah or anybody of any worth because he had been executed by crucifixion. Now, that didn't just mean he was not persona non grata according to the Romans, but the implication was that he therefore was rejected by God the Father. Interestingly enough, if you heard my sermon yesterday, he was rejected by God the Father temporarily. And that, that rejection, that turning of the Father away from Jesus on the cross, was because Jesus took his sins upon himself. So the fact that he was rejected by the Father for a short time, while he was carrying our sins, um, was an, is an important part of what the atonement was. And yet that's part of what the Jews perceived as being, okay, he could possibly be the Messiah. So the, the sh scorning of shame is the shame of the cross. Okay? Anything else? Any other questions about that? Rich, you got a question on your face. Well, I do. I was wondering how a book like Hebrews gets down through history and comes to us as long as well as other books. I mean, they were written by somebody, and did they have to be copied, and people hung on to them, and how does that all? They did. They had to be copied. Um, the from the earliest days when these letters were written, and they were written. In some cases, there may have been multiple copies sent out. There's a suggestion, for instance, we talked about this in the Pauline letters, that when Paul tells the, um, the church at Ephesus to get the letter that he sent to the Laodiceans, is that right? No, he, it was somebody else he said that to. Anyway, the suggestion is he may have written the same letter, and, but mailed it to two or three different churches with different headings, you know, that said to the church in Laodicea or the church at Ephesus or whatever. Um, and so that, that may have been the case, but usually it was one letter that was written. When it was received, it, the, the letters that people were led by the Holy Spirit to perceive out as being God's own work to them, they would copy them, and they would distribute them, and they would take them to other churches, and they would make sure people, and they would read them publicly. Then from that point, there was a process of copying them down through time. Um, the which was an onerous task, which is why Gutenberg did such an extraordinary thing when he invented the printing press. Okay. The Protestant Reformation probably would not have succeeded the way it did as quickly as it did if it hadn't been for the fact that Gutenberg had been in the printing press about 100 years before that. Okay. Because the printing was catching on so fast, the Reformation used it. But prior to this, it was a matter of copying them, distributing them. Very early on, the church began to have a very clear sense of which of these letters that had been written were really God's canon, God's rule for their lives, the thing that had come through people like Paul and you know James and others, but were God's own instruction to them, and they continued to copy them. That's now the first century or what? Well, uh, we believe pretty much all of these were well, we believe all of these were written in the first century. The latest of them would have been in the nineties, AD nineties, and that would have been John, probably in the Revelation, uh, and the in the epistles of John. But the, the liberal scholars have always said, well, this stuff gets hand copied, and so it got messed up, and people added stuff, and they put their own stuff in there and everything else. Well, that, that sort of rumor, that sort of liberal interpretation of, the, of the, the handing down of copied manuscripts continued until the 1940s and 50s, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls are not the New Testament, they're the Old Testament, which are even older and had been copied more often than the New Testament. 
what they discovered was that the most, these most ancient of, uh, versions of the Old Testament that they found, there were virtually no differences, and no differences of any consequence, between these most ancient Dead Sea Scrolls and the uh, other copies that we had, which liberal scholars had said, well, these have been polluted and messed up and things added to and taken out of anything else. There was nothing of any theological consequence between the Dead Sea Scrolls and other versions we had of the Old Testament. Now, if that's true of the Old Testament, which is even older and been copied more, then the same thing would hold true of the New Testament. That we, we firmly believe that scholars today, it doesn't have to be evangelical scholars, any sort of balanced scholars, look at this and say, we have no reason to believe that this is not, for all intents and purposes, accurate representations of what the, uh, the original documents look like in the New Testament. You know, we do have, you know, the oldest ones we have are early in the second century. Um, the very oldest. And the reason we don't have older than that is because these things were mostly written on papyrus, which is like tissue paper almost. You know, it's very, and, and it's organic, and it can rot, and it can, you know, it doesn't last very long. So that's why it had to be copied over and over. But we believe that it is, uh, there, there's more, there's more attestation in terms of documents to attest to the reliability and accuracy of the New Testament than any other document that has ever existed by a factor of 20-fold. In fact, in your book, I think it is, in, your, in the book you have, they have a chart which takes the New Testament documents and they compare it to the, work, the writings of Homer and all these other ancient, or even of Shakespeare, and says how many documents exist and how old are they, and the New Testament blows everything else out of the water in terms of how many documents we have and how old they are. Questions or comments about anything else on Hebrews or any of that? All right, I've got two minutes till two. Let's take a break. Um, I think we can take a ten-minute break. We'll start back at eight minutes after. Okay, let's talk about the book of James. James um, was written by the, the epistle of James was written by James, the brother of Jesus. The reason we say that, there, James was a very popular name in the New Testament and in New Testament times. In fact, there are no fewer than five different Jameses referred to in the New Testament. But the only two that were of sufficient significance to have written a letter like this that would have been accepted by the churches, and the writer of the book of James, as much as any writer in, in Scripture, writes with authority. I mean, he basically puts his foot down and tells it like it is. The only two writers that would have probably been able to write with such authority and to be readily accepted for some of the things he said would have been James the Apostle, um, the brother of John, but James the Apostle was martyred in AD 62. Um, and the it's unlikely that, um, according to Josephus, it's unlikely that this book was written by James the Apostle or there would have been more references to being part of the apostolic band as well. We believe that uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, James, the half-brother of Jesus, was the pro a prominent leader in the early church. In fact, when Peter, who started out as sort of the accepted leader of the church, in Acts 17, when Peter leaves Jerusalem, James apparently takes over. In fact, the last thing that Peter says before he starts traveling outside Jerusalem is he said, tell James and the others that I have been released from prison miraculously. And then he leaves town. James is the one who heads the Jerusalem Council um, when, when they have the meeting where they talk about what's going on with the uh, Gentiles who have become Christians. It is James that writes the official declaration of what the council believes at that point. So we uh, are quite confident that this is James the Greater, as he's sometimes called, who is James the brother of Jesus. We believe that this was probably written about 46 to 49 AD. Uh, we say that because the, um, there are several characteristics here that lead us to believe that this is one of the earliest of the books of the Bible. In fact, I believe it's the earliest. Generally, they think it's either this book or it's the book of Galatians, as I said earlier. The several reasons why we believe that it was written as early as 45, I think 46 is probably the best date in there, is one, it's the references here to Christians, um, there, there's no allowance made at this point for Gentile Christians, which means this must have happened before the Jerusalem Council met, before the decisions, before enough Gentiles started becoming Christians that that became an issue. 
because he makes no reference to Gentiles. It's entirely, uh, the assumption is that if he's talking to Christians, that they're Jewish, because it's a very Jewish focus. Um, there's no reference made to the issue of Gentile circumcision, or what it takes for a Gentile to be a follower of Jesus. Um, it's also true that in the book of James, he refers to the church as the synagogue, or the meeting place. There, it's, it's early enough that they have not yet developed a sense in which the Christian church is a completely different meeting than the Jewish synagogue gathering. Again, the, that was because in the early days, all of the Christians were Jews, and they would just gather as, as a sort of a subset of the synagogue. There is a... The, the allusions to the teachings of Jesus are consistent with in terms of content, but the wording is different than what is found in the Synoptic Gospels. And if this had been written later, after the Gospels had been written, then it's likely he would have quoted them exactly, and he doesn't. So the suggestion it was written before the earliest of the Synoptic Gospels, which leads us to believe that it was written sometime in the last half of the, of the 5th century, that is the 40s, um, uh, not the 5th century, the, of the 5th decade of Jesus, okay? Um, the theme, of course, is faith without works is dead. The theme is that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it's not that works will save you. It's not that being good or doing good things will cause you to be righteous before God. He's quite clear about that not being the case. But that if you are a believer in Jesus, then you will act in a certain way. It will live itself out. Faith without works is dead means if you have faith, it will be alive in you somehow. Uh, those of you who have been in one of the two classes I've taught in James here, I've, I've said... I struggled for a long time to find the right analogy about this, and I think the best analogy is that if you had a horse, and it was laying out in a field, and it hadn't moved in three weeks, you better put dirt over it because it's dead. All right? Now, anything that is living demonstrates motion. It has some movement. There is some movement that indicates life is present. That's all James is saying, is if your faith is laid out in the field and hasn't moved in a long period of time, your faith is dead. And it probably means it never was alive in the first place. And so, if you have any kind of real faith at all, it will have some kind of visible manifestation, some movement in your life. That's what the theme is. Some people have believed that, I mentioned that this book in Galatians, Paul's uh, letter to the churches in Galatia, were the, uh, the two, for certain, the two of the earliest written New Testament books. Um, some people have said that James and Paul contradict each other. That Paul, like in Ephesians, says that by grace you are saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. James says faith without works is dead. You know, if you have real faith, you have work. Uh, you'll have works. You say that you have uh, uh, faith. Well, show me your works. I will show you my faith by the works that I do. E even Martin Luther thought that James. Maybe he had it wrong. He wouldn't completely dismiss it. In fact, he quotes it, and he quotes it positively in places. But he ref uh, Luther referred to James as a right straw epistle. And he put it in the back of his Bible so he wouldn't have to flip through it any more than he had to. Okay? Um, and the, the reason is, I believe, very simply, that Luther is a whole, you know, his whole call by God was to fight the orientation the Catholic Church up at that time had on salvation by works. That you got saved if you were obedient by doing the things the church told you to do. And since that's what he was fighting, Luther felt like uh, that, that James was going right there, and he didn't care for it. So that's why he had a problem with that. Um, there we go. So the theme is true faith gives evidence of that faith through righteous living. And again, while it doesn't contradict Paul's emphasis on salvation by faith, Paul may, or I'm sorry, James may have been written either to balance Paul's theology, or I think more likely the other way around, that Paul began to write Galatians and then later Ephesians in order to balance, to complement, not to contradict, but to complement the approach that James had taken. You are saved by grace through faith. A free gift, not based on works. But once you get saved, then you need to show it. There needs to be something in your life that shows that you are sincere in this faith. There is a very good little chart in your, in, if you have the book, the Nelson book, uh, which compares Paul and, uh, and James in this regard. And so I think they are complementary to one another. But because of that 
that controversy and some other things. Uh, Ron Blue, uh, his written commentary, he said, few books of the Bible have been more maligned than the little book of James. Controversy has always waged, waged over its authorship, its date, its recipients, its canonicity, and its unity. People are always griping about it. And I think one of the reasons they griped about it is because you read the book of James and you're going to get convicted if you're, if you're paying attention. James is laser being sharp on how you need to act if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Okay? That if you have faith, it should look a certain way. It should be demonstrated. Now, the, the purpose of this letter was to exhort the early believers, that is, the Jewish believers, to be sincere in following Christ by how they lived out their lives. Um, and the whole focus is of a Christian's life is based upon their belief in Jesus. Uh, what you are, what you do, what you say, what you feel, what you have, all of them should be a reflection of your faith in Jesus Christ, according to James. And so, it's not something I, when we have the Bible study on James, I've had several people come up to me and say, you know, I've been going to church for 50 years and I have never heard anybody preach on or teach the book of James because it's just too hard. Okay, well, we do. <laughs> you know, we'll tackle it uh, because it is God's word to us. The three sections, if you want to outline the book of James, the first 18 verses of the first chapter deal with the test of faith. And in fact, verse 2 says, Consider it pure, pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Pure joy when you face trials. And then he goes on to talk about how we are supposed to experience, and as Christians, how we are supposed to deal with some of the struggles and difficulties we have, the trials of our faith. Um, then goes on to talk about the characteristics of our faith, and then ultimately the triumph of our faith at the second coming of the Lord. All right? Um, the word faith occurs 16 times in the book of James, as well as frequent occurrences of the word works or working. That occurs 13 times just in chapter 2. So faith and works are the two counterbalancing themes that come into the book of James. Let's see, what else do I want to tell you about that? Um, so let me give you a couple of passages here. The first one is James 1, 19 to 25. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. See what I mean about the convicting part? <laughs> For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. We're studying James in our Bible study. It's like we keep coming back saying, what do you really think, James? You know, <laughs> tell us what you really think. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. A second passage from James 2, starting with the 14th verse. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If, you, if one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. And shudder. <laughs> See why it's hard to preach from book of James. <laughs> um, any questions about James? Or comments? Pardon? One of the statements put it so very well. Um, on the one hand, you're striving to, to do the right and do enough to get saved. And the other hand, it's a free gift of God that's given to you, and out of thankfulness and joy you do what you can because you're thankful and joyful. Yeah. And it makes all the difference in, in your attitude toward whether it's a burden or whether it's a joy. Yeah. Good works does not cause our salvation. Good works are the result of our salvation. Someone has said, don't try to be good so that God can love you. Let God love you so that you can be good. good. All right. We get it in the wrong order. James is about the business of getting in the right order. Once you have let God love you, once you are saved, once you are in Christ, then you need 
to allow him to cause you to live out good works in your life. And if it's not happening, then you need to seriously say to yourself, did I really believe this? Did I really accept it? It's a book about conviction. Becky. Well, I can imagine, I mean, even now it's hard to even, you know, teach someone new about the concept, but we've had the blessing of the Bible for all these hundreds of years. In, in the beginning, he was trying to teach all these people this new concept. Yeah. Basically, a new concept of a different way of thinking. But um, we've had the blessing of, uh, well, many of us have, of, of generations of people that already had the belief and walked in glory. Right. So that had to be, no wonder he was mad. He yeah. was trying to beat his head against the wall. Well, you're right. James is, is talking to Jewish Christians. This is early on. You know, the idea of the Christian faith is new. It's different to them. And the Jewish faith had been one where you're, you have an obligation to do things. You know, there, there's a set of rules. There's the Big Ten, and then there's 608 others that you're supposed to follow. Okay? Literally. And so, being obedient to God meant following all of those rules. And James is trying to say, you know, just because you've now become a Christian does not mean that all of the responsibility that you had for doing the right thing is gone. You still do have a responsibility to follow the moral law, to do what's morally right, to let your faith show itself out. So many uh, Jews, apparently, when they became Christians, they said, Phew, I don't have to worry about what I do anymore. Okay? In fact, that's it. Paul was writing against the legalists, those who said you have to follow all the rules, and that's why you get faith, you know, his, his approach. James was writing against the libertines. People who said, now that I'm a believer in Jesus, I don't have I can do anything I want. I don't have to worry about having any evidence of action in my life. Neither extreme is right. They are both wrong. Paul corrected one, James corrects the other. They're complementary to each other. Both of them trying to find the narrow way for people. Okay? Alright, let's talk about 1 Peter. Um, there are two epistles from Peter, first and second Peter, of course, that's because they're two, first and second. Um, Peter, there was no question in the early uh, testimony of the church that 1 Peter was written by Peter. Modern scholars have questioned all of these. So modern scholars have doubted whether or not Peter wrote this book, but there's pretty strong internal evidence in terms of references to Jesus' life and teaching as being experienced firsthand. Um, the, there are strong similarities between the content of 1 Peter and the content of some of Peter's speeches in the book of Acts. There's also some similarities between Peter and Mark's gospel. And you remember the gospel of Mark is believed to be the gospel according to Peter because Mark was an assistant and secretary to Peter. So the gospel of Mark is believed to be Peter's witness to the experience of uh, having been with Jesus. So um, there is strong traditional internal and external testimony that this is written by Peter. We believe that it was written about A.D. 62 or 63. Um, Peter talks about persecution. That's really the theme here. And uh, he, as he's referring to persecution, the description that he gives probably would have been very different if he had written it after AD 64, because AD 64 is when the really horrid persecution began under uh, Nero. Nero's persecutions of Christians was of a scale and of a, a macabre kind of sense that had not existed before in the, in the under any of the other Roman emperors. Nero blamed the Christians for burning Rome when pretty much everybody knew then and knows now that Nero had it done himself. He wanted to burn Rome down because he wanted to rebuild it the way he wanted it. And yet he needed somebody to blame so that he wouldn't be held responsible, so he blamed the Christians. And as a result, they were persecuted in ways, for instance, Nero would take Christians and have them doused with pitch, pitch that is burnt tar, something that will burn strapped to crosses in his garden and lit a fire while they were alive to light his garden parties. You know? So the fact that Peter is writing specifically to Christians to encourage them, to give them a divine perspective about uh, suffering persecution, the tone that he takes is about persecution, but it's not the level of persecution at this point that would have happened if it was under Nero. So that's why we believe it was written before AD 64, probably 62 or 63. He also refers to Mark as being present. We believe that Peter was writing this from Rome, because the last years of uh, Peter's life had spent in Rome, which is why he became traditionally known as the Bishop of Rome. Peter is the first Bishop of Rome. Peter and Paul were both martyred in Rome. 
And when he refers to Mark being present, we know that Mark was in um, was in Rome the last year of his life as well. So all of that indicates to us it was written from Rome prior to, but uh, not too long prior to the persecutions of Nero. So around AD 62 or 63. There's various kinds of themes in terms of Christian life and duty, but they are primarily oriented toward how to how to continue to sustain your faith in light of persecution. This was the, a major theme um, here and later on as well. Um, Peter writes to, as I said earlier, various churches that are scattered throughout Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. He specifically says that he is writing to the churches in several of the Roman provinces that would have been the northern section of Asia Minor, but not just specific churches, again, the way Paul would have done. Um, the attestation of this being by Peter, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Eusebius, all of the early church fathers pretty much acknowledged that Peter was the one that wrote this. And I, I, you may wonder, why does Ross keep telling us you know, who attests that this was written? Because whether or not these books were written by who wrote them and when they were written is a primary area of dispute by liberal scholars. They will claim that, no, Peter couldn't have written this. You know, no, it couldn't have been written that early. Well, if, if it says, Peter, you know, if it says internally, I, Peter, am writing this, and yet it's not true that there's a lie right up front, then they then can discount the whole rest of it. The content's not valid. And so being able to attest to why we think it was written by the people that historically or traditionally are, uh, it's attributed to and the dates are very important in terms of a, just establishing a platform of reliability for these books. Okay. Um, apparently Peter was assisted by a secretary, uh, Silas. Um, in one place he's called Silvanus because Silvanus was the is the Latinized version of Silvus, which is a Greek or, or Silas. I'm sorry, Silas. Uh, Silas is a Greek name. Silvanus is a Latin name. It's the same name. There were Latinized and Greek versions of names back then, and of Hebrew names as well. Um, we believe that Silas, based upon what we read in this, was a Jerusalem Christian, a Roman citizen apparently, who had great facility in the Greek language. This was written. Um, well. Get on from that. Um, where, how do you go? I want to go on this. I'm not, I'm, excuse my hesitation. The doctrines that, that Peter touches on in here, there are various things, as I said, about the Christian life and Christian responsibility, but particularly in light of the theme of suffering and the problem of suffering and the problem of persecution. The, some of the specific things that Paul is doing here is he provides direction for believers to keep their focus on the coming revelation of Jesus as their deliverance from the persecution they're experiencing. He talks to the believers about following Christ as their perfect example in suffering. Since Jesus himself suffered on our behalf, he is the example that Christians should look to as they're experiencing suffering and trying to understand how they could, uh, could go through it. He talks about living in the world uh, only as being according to the call they've received as God's special people. You're not like everyone else. You are called out by God as his special people. And how you deal with suffering is a big part of your witness to the truth of Jesus Christ. And so the key concept here really is suffering for Christ. And that we can take hope and comfort in the fact that Jesus is coming again. We can expect the glory of Christ to be revealed to us and that believers will ultimately experience salvation and a redemption from the current suffering as they've experienced redemption from sin. Um, the whole person and work of Christ as being the answer to suffering and the difficulties that are being faced is the theme of 1 Peter. Give me, let me give you a couple of verses. 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances <laughs> to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. In other words, all the prophets down through Jewish history have, have looked forward to this time when Christ would be revealed. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Peter here is saying that down through the history of the Jewish people, the prophets have looked forward to exactly the time you're now living in, as difficult as it is. And in fact, 
God revealed to those prophets the very reason they were prophesying is to prepare for you, for this blessing. This is Paul, uh, Peter's way of talking about you being a special people, the fulfillment of time and the promise God has made. Even angels long to look into these things. And so as difficult as it may seem, you, are the you Christians are the fulfillment of this long time expectation. And then 1 Peter 4, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. There are the themes of Christ's glory being revealed, and of redeeming us from the current suffering, but especially of Jesus and His suffering being, in effect, a model for those who are experiencing persecution now. That we can look to Him. That we can take our comfort in the suffering that he experienced on our behalf. Questions about 1 Peter? Okay, whereas 1 Peter is talking about uh, the, the difficulties from persecution from the outside, we then come to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter is more concerned about something that's happening inside the church. Not from outside the church, but inside the church. And that is the false teachers that have come into the church and that are leading people astray. We believe this was written probably A.D. 64 to 66, uh, a couple of years later, uh, two to three years later than uh, 1 Peter. So theme to oppose false uh, teachers, the internal opposition, the destructive heresies, to quote uh, Peter in this. The general outline would be the need for people to, uh, first chapter, to cultivate Christian character, Secondly, to be, to be concerned about, and he has a condemnation for false teachers in the second chapter. And then the third, confidence of Christ's return, which again is reiterating the theme he had in the first chapter. Second Peter was written at the very end, we believe, of Peter's life. And it has, when you read Second Timothy, that is the last letter that Paul wrote. And you get a sense in it that Paul is saying goodbye. And he was martyred shortly after that. Well, the same thing is true in Second Peter. You get the sense there is a resignation, and not like a hopeless resignation, but simply an acceptance that this is the end of his life. And so um, this is Peter's last message before his martyrdom. It's a continuation of the theme from 1 Peter, and that is beware of the dangers. 1 Peter is beware of the dangers from outside. 2 Peter, beware of the dangers from inside. The suffering of the readers, persecution has continued and is referred to in this epistle. Um, in fact, it hasn't abated. It has gotten worse because, again, you'll notice the date. AD 64 was when Nero's persecution started. So rather than having gotten better, the persecution against the Christians has gotten worse and may have made them more likely to listen to false teaching because, you know, they, in the persecution, they were grasping for some reassurance. But Peter writes to them to tell them that's not the way to go. Second Peter is probably the most disputed book in the New Testament in terms of author and style, and yet again, there are both internal and external witnesses to the fact that this is written by Peter. Uh, he refers in Second Peter, for instance, to the first letter that he had written, the indication that there are two, um, and there's various other things. The, the differences in style, which is what many of the scholars look at, the, Peter had a different scribe here. It's not Silvanus or, or Silas anymore. A different scribe, a different writer, and that can change the style. We know that. Um, in the fourth century, Athanasius and Augustine, uh, Saint Augustine, both confirmed that Second Peter was part of canon, and so it has since the fourth century been accepted as part of canon. Um, while it's least attested as, and most disputed of any of the books in the New Testament, it has significant external support, more so than some of the other books. External support means. People in the early church who attested to the fact that this was written by Peter when it said it was written, as opposed to internal evidence, which is things that are actually said inside the letter itself. This letter was written to a group of believers. We don't know exactly whom. Um, it is kind of a final testament. It's at the close of his career, and it addresses the issue of the precious Christian faith to both Jewish and Gentile believers. I say we don't know exactly who it was written to as a group of believers, but we do know. They were in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, just like the first letter to, uh, from Peter. Um, the theme of the false teachers, which comes out of this one, as I say, there's a, there's a strong theme, especially in the, the, the general epistles or the Catholic epistles, 
also in the book of Galatians, there's a couple of other references in Paul, but especially here, to the false teachers, that the body of Christ, the church, was in immediate danger from the fact that its life will be ripped apart by these people who are teaching something that's contrary to the truth of God's word. Um, and so the theme, you could say, is warning against false teachers or prophets, mockers with false words. Let me give you a couple of passages here. From 2 Peter 1, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Here, Peter is saying, don't listen to these teachers if they teach you something that's contrary to what you've received as God's word to you. And so he's establishing the, the reliability of uh, God's word. No prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This principle of inspiration. Um, it's interesting here when Peter talks about people who wrote scripture being carried along by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> this, this description of inspiration allows for different styles. See, some people have said, okay, the Holy Spirit did not write the, the New Testament because you can tell Paul's style is different than Peter's style is different from James's style. Well, if you get the sense that God used the people, but he carried them along by the Holy Spirit, he allowed for their style to be evident. But the content was, was given by the Spirit. So there's a particular kind of theology of inspiration that comes out in, in 2 Peter. And from 2 Peter 3, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. You know, there's several things there. One, the fact that the Lord hasn't forgotten his promise to come back. And if he delays, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. If the Lord is delaying, it's because he wants more people to have an opportunity to repent and come to him. That's why he is not returning, <coughs> Peter says. And yet, when he does come, he will come immediately, like a thief, with a roar, the elements destroyed by fire, everything laid bare. And knowing that that's what's going to happen, don't you think you should live a holy life? <laughs> Duh. Okay. Any questions about Second Peter? Let's talk about the epistles of John. I'm going to go through these one at a time, but do it fairly quickly. The book of 1 John... Um, written by the Apostle John. The theme is the lure of worldliness and, once again, the guile of false teachers. He is cautioning us against false teachers. This is written late. The letters of uh, John, well, John is the latest written of all the Gospels. First, second, third John were written quite late, and the book of Revelation very late, because John lived longer than any of the people, who, other people who had known Jesus. He lived to a ripe old age into his 90s and died of natural causes. The only one of the apostles, as far as we know, that died of natural causes. He continued to have an active ministry. Tradition has it that John the Apostle had uh, traveled to Ephesus and was living in Ephesus, that he took Mary, the mother of Jesus, with him. There is still a traditional location of the home of Mary, Jesus' mother, in, in Ephesus. And uh, he, from <coughs> Ephesus, John for the whole rest of his life, for many, many, many years, was seen as the elder. In fact, in John 2 and John 3, he refers to himself as the elder. He was like the elder statesman, the last of the people who had known Jesus. And so he was held in such high esteem, high regard, that um, he, for instance, knew Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna, one of the cities in, in near Ephesus, and um, it's modern-day Izmir. And so Polycarp knew John. Then Polycarp passed on to these others, Clement of Alexandria who came up and, and various others, all of these stories that he had heard from John during John's last years. And so this tradition, uh, the story was that when John couldn't actually walk very well anymore, they made a sedan chair for him, and some of the, the strong young men of the church would carry him from town to town so that he could preach and minister to people. So he had an enormous influence in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Um, the, in fact, the book of Revelation, which of course the same John wrote, um, includes letters to, in Revelation to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which 
the reason why he's writing those seven churches is he was in Ephesus and these seven churches were all close enough by that he had visited them, he had encouraged them, they had been sort of under his tutelage. And so he writes to them and about them in the book of Revelation because that was Western Asia Minor, Western Turkey as we know it today, was the area that he was active in. Okay? The theme of this book is fellowship with God and the practice of righteous living and love. The purpose is to oppose the Gnostic heresies that were common in the early church. Now, talk for a minute about these Gnostic heresies. And again, liberal scholars will say, well, the Gnostic heresies didn't really arise until the 2nd century, and yet we've got, what, six or seven books of the New Testament that talk about it. Um, the Gnostic heresies particularly uh, took a Greek approach that the, anything material, anything physical was inherently bad that the goal was to get rid of the physical and only focus on the spiritual, which is why knowledge, which is a non-physical thing, was the whole focus of their orientation. It was believed that if Jesus was the Son of God, he could not have come in a physical body. So they denied the physical incarnation, and they therefore denied the resurrection, because if he didn't have a physical body, his body couldn't have been resurrected. Duh. And so all of this, this sort of based upon this rejection of the material world and the physical body, led to a lot of things. Well, if the physical body is uh, is bad, if the material body is bad, then what I do with the physical body that I'm stuck in for right now doesn't really matter. And so there was a spirit of licentiousness. I can, I can attend orgies, I can be a glutton, I can do whatever I want because this body is bad anyway, so it doesn't matter what I do with it. And that that's not necessary to live a moral life in order for God to accept me. All it is is if I have the secret knowledge. Really good package. <laughs> I, I think I, I can launch a church next week with that message and we really grow. Okay? And yet that was the whole thing. That's what Gnosticism, it was, it, morality didn't matter, physical body was a bad thing. The whole thing was, do you, are you one of the, the select few that has been given the secret knowledge? And Jesus was perceived not as a redeemer, because you don't need to be redeemed if there's no such thing as sin. And so he was known as the, the knowledge giver kind of thing. It was a messed up theology, a messed up teaching. And so John, in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, well, 1st and 2nd John especially, is dealing uh, contrary to that. Okay? He's, he's, he's opposing that. Um, the two, it's, it, it breaks out real simply in terms of the large categories of outline. The first is the basis of fellowship on what are we bound together as the body of Christ. And then the second half is how do we then act in the behavior of the fellowship. And in the process of that, he contradicts or counters the false teaching. Um, I don't want to spend too much more time in detail here. Let me give you a couple of the verses. Because we don't have a lot more time. Uh, the first passage we could look at is 1 John 1, 3, and 4. We proclaim to you that, uh, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. Remember, John was the last person alive that had personally witnessed Jesus. Not only his teaching in life, but his physical resurrection and his ascension. So John says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and is with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make your joy complete. Take joy in this great celebration. Um, and forget these people who are telling you that Jesus wasn't really a human being and that he wasn't really resurrected. He, you know, he, he isn't coming back. First John 5 says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. It is our belief in the resurrected Jesus that we have eternal life, not some, some esoteric knowledge that we think we might have gained. Okay. Questions about 1 John? I, I hope you've read this already. If you haven't, go, up, go home and read it today. All right, the, the, the general epistles. The book of 2 John. Written slightly later, around AD 90, we believe. The uh, point here is only one chapter. It is to encourage discernment in receiving teachers, that is, true teachers, and to uh, recognize that there are false teachers out there who are misleading the faithful, and again, to oppose the Gnostic heresies that were common in the early church. 
The point, uh, one chapter, the first six verses are that we should abide in God's commandments that have been given us, especially as fulfilled in Christ Jesus, and then uh, do not pay attention to or abide in false teachers. Okay? It's in this, God, this epistle and the third epistle of John that he identifies himself as the elder. Now, and presbyteros is the Greek word for that. He's not talking about a, a literal elder in a church here. He had come to be known as the elder, the capital E, being the senior statesman, you know, the oldest, most revered of all of the Christian leaders. In, and so he uses the name for himself. They apparently used for him in the churches, and that is he was the elder. That's how he was recognized. It's an affectionate kind of designation he apparently received. Um, this letter is written, as I said earlier, to the elect lady and her children. Some people believe that might have actually been a woman and her children that he was writing this to, similar to uh, Philemon, Paul's letter being written to an individual. But most scholars today believe that he's referring instead to a collective reference, that, that the elect lady is a church and her children are the churches that have been planted out of that church. And that's who he's really concerned with here. Um, I believe that is the most probable explanation for who this was written to. Um, his concern is to reestablish or reaffirm, rather, the truth of the apostolic doctrine in that is in accordance with the commandments. He identifies in verse 7, for instance, that many deceivers have gone out into the world, people who do not confess Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. They do not confess Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. There's that Gnostic heresy. And that's what he was fighting. His big focus, even though it's only one chapter, he uses the word truth nine times. He uses the word commandment, as in be obedient to the things that we have been told by God, 14 times to protect the biblical doctrine of the incarnation. If you, um, 2 John 7 through 10, and again, there's no, uh, it's just one chapter. So verses 7 through 10. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Beware of false teachers. Okay. Let's look at 3 John. Again, one chapter, we believe, written right about the same time as the second... Uh, um, you've gone past... Oh, sorry. Well, this thing really rips. There you go. <laughs> written about the same time, um, to encourage, to enjoy and continue fellowship with fellow believers. This is an interesting one because it is a, this is the most specific of all the general epistles. Um, he's trying to commend worthy Christian workers and warn the people who are not open to those Christian workers. He specifically refers to two people. Gaius is commended for being willing to open his home to people that are sent out by John and others who are true teachers, opening his home and welcoming them and taking care of them. And then there's a character named uh, Diotrephes. Diotrephes apparently has kind of taken over a local church he has forbidden uh, teachers who are sent by John and others, in other words, the correct teachers, he's forbidden them from coming, and anyone who allowed them to come and stay in their homes, he's thrown them out of the church. So he is really ruling with an iron fist. Third John is written to endorse the openness and fellowship for true teachers of the gospel, and to be critical of anyone who is trying to establish themselves as being so much in charge that they're not open to the truth coming from anywhere else or for caring for people. It is the most personal letter that John wrote uh, to the beloved Gaius, and uh, we believe that he is writing again to somewhere in Asia Minor because he, the indication is he's well known, and so these would have been people that knew him. And he again identifies himself as the elder. Um, the encouragement is that we should have hospitality and support itinerant Christian workers if they are true in the doctrine and not to demonstrate the kind of selfishness that Diotrephes uses in order to try to make himself, you know, the, the hefty over everything that's going on, okay? Faithful ministry, self-service to others as fel uh, and fellow workers in the gospel is the theme. The 
passage, one chapter, again, 3 John 5 to 8, and then verse 11 says this, Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. He's talking to Gaius here. They have told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the name, it was for the sake of the name, capital, that's Jesus, that they went out receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the good. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Okay. And the last book we're going to look at today is the little book of Jude. Again, one chapter. The last three books we're looking at here are all just one chapter. We believe that Jude was written by um, another half-brother of Jesus, Judas, who was the full brother of James the Greater, James who wrote the, the epistle of James. Now, it is called the book of Jude, not the book of Judas, for a simple reason. When you hear Judas, what do you think of? <laughs> Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus. Because of that, Mark, Jude, Judas was a fairly common name. But people who had that name tended to start being called or referred to as Jude, so that there was not the association made between Judas Iscariot and that name. So we have this as the book of Jude rather than the book of Judas for that very simple reason. Okay? It's like, how many kids have you ever known who are named Adolf? All right? What people? What's that? My the last couple years. Your father. Okay. Well, it's, and a good man he was, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, 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 sorry. It's not a common name anymore for obvious reasons. Right. So, and he would have been born prior to that. So. Yeah, prior to the World War II. Exactly, prior to World War II. So it would not have had that negative connotation. Uh, that's why I said how many kids do you know? Um, the name Judas had become unpopular. Even people that had it wanted to be called something else. So it became Jude. We believe that this was written uh, fairly late, either AD 60 to 65 or AD 70 to 80. We could put up there. And the difference is. Second Peter and the book of Jude seem to be referring, are very similar in a couple of places. The date of this depends upon, is Peter quoting Jude, or is Jude quoting Peter? Or possibly, they're both referring to some other source. Um, if Jude was first and Peter, Second Peter is quoting Jude, then it probably was these dates, 60 to 65. If Second Peter was written first and Jude is quoting him, then it was probably written 70 to 80 AD doesn't really matter. It's not that big a deal. But just so you know, we do think about this stuff. Okay? Um, the theme is condemnation for false teachers, again, and libertines. Remember, part of the Gnostic heresy was, since the body is bad, and it, at best case doesn't matter, then what I do with my body doesn't matter, and I can go out and do anything I want to, and that will not interfere with my relationship with God. Jude, like John is talking specifically against that. He's encouraging the faithful to remain strong in their faith, to deny this, this heretical teaching, and to recognize that they have an obligation to live well. The purpose is to make clear that salvation did not give us license to sin. You are not free to do whatever you want just because you're in Jesus. And they must oppose the libertine teachers. Libertine, of course, is someone who says, you know, you're free to do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, even though it's one chapter, we can see it as four sections. First, uh, Jude declares his purpose. He then describes what false teachers look like, um, verses 5 to 16. He then defends against the false teachers in terms of um, defend how they should be addressed. And then there's a doxology at the end of Jude. So the whole focus really is the issue of false teachers. Um, so we have, you may never known it or noticed it, two of the general epistles are written by, we believe, half-brothers of Jesus. And that's the best scholarship. Well, James and Judas, we believe, were, were sons of Mary um, by Joseph after Jesus was born, um, of course. Now, if you're Catholic, then you don't buy that because the Catholic Church believes that Judas, that Mary was always a virgin. She never had any other children. And it excuses away the verses in the New Testament to talk about his brothers and sisters as being cousins or some other relation, but not actually brothers and sisters. I think they're stringing at gnats. I mean, I, they're... they're you know, they're having to work way too hard in order to try to find an excuse for something that seems pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Tradition is that Jude and James were written by half-brothers of Jesus. Um, passage, Jude 3, 4, and 17, 19. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. In other words, 
Jude here is saying, I wanted to write to you and celebrate the salvation that we share, but I can't do that because there's a problem, and I need to address the problem instead of the celebration for salvation, and that is the false teachers. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. But, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. Jude was not an apostle, even though he's half-brother of Jesus. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are men who divide, who follow mere natural instincts, and do not have the Spirit. That's the book of Jude, and the last of the general or Catholic epistles. Any questions about that or about anything else that we've talked about here? You will remember I started out this survey class saying by its very nature, by definition, a survey has to be superficial. We just skip over the top to introduce you to these books. That's why part of your assignment is to read them so that you actually are getting exposed to the full content. But there's no way we can deal with all the books in the New Testament in eight weeks unless we are just hitting high points. I want you, um, we talked about before when we talked about Bible study, last term in this term, and then the spiritual disciplines course. The first step, the first goal in learning what God's Word says to us is to have a basic understanding of what's in it. Before you can really begin to develop uh, a sense that the Word is seeping into your life and you're applying it, you have to have a sense of what's in there. So that's why we start with survey classes. Last term, Old Testament, this term, New Testament. So that you at least get a sense of what these things are and when they were and who wrote them and how they fit together. Then you have a responsibility to get more immersed in it so that it begins to, begins to affect your life. Okay? Does that make sense? Other questions or comments? Marvin. Previously, I always thought, you know, those the teachers and preachers that are, that are really important people. These are all saying when they come, put them up in your house, welcome them, send them on from God, you know, bless them, and so on. And then and I'm realizing, as the scripture says, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. And that's for all of us, not just mm -hmm. preachers and teachers. That's right. Whatever, that's, that's the sign. <laughs> right. We all have responsibilities. Yeah. Now, uh, the New Testament identifies kind of a hierarchy, you know, um, apostles and prophets, teachers, you know, on down from there. We just had, yesterday, we had an afternoon brunch, afternoon, it wasn't a brunch, it was a dinner or whatever, a brunch dinner, <laughs> 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, for the elders and deacons, both those who are coming on as new elders and deacons and those who are going out. Somebody said it's for those who are coming and going, and I said, well, <laughs> or for those who don't know if they're coming or going. But, uh, but unfortunately, some people didn't make it. Uh, they, they, they didn't know how to get there, and they wandered around for an hour trying to find the place. So, uh, but something I said to the elders and deacons of our church when, when we started is, you know, the preacher gets to stand up there and everybody gets to see him or her, and everybody thinks that that's the most important thing, and yet the church was not built first on preachers or pastors. It was built on apostles who became the elders. And then in very short order after that, they elected the first deacons who were the service arms of the body. And so the church really is built on, the heart of the church are the elders, and the original elders were the apostles, and then they added elders after that, and the deacons. The pastors and preachers actually came later. Now, yes, the apostles and, and the elders were responsible for teaching. But, um, yeah, we, we sometimes get it backwards. The people in our churches today that are most visible are not the building blocks of the church. They weren't historically, nor do I think they are today. I mean, churches get new, you know, new preachers all the time. But um, it's important that we have a, a solid block. And people, lay people, who are willing to serve as elders, who are willing to serve as deacons, who are willing to live out the faith in their lives. Uh, and, you know, Jude would have been one of those elders. Uh, as what James was the chief elder of the church in Jerusalem, so absolutely true. Anything else? Okay, now, for those of you who are in the Wednesday class, when are we meeting on Wednesday? 12.30. 12.30. 12.30.